drowsiness is red alert. Hey everyone, my name is Uzaina and I'm talking to you from the far lands of Goku. Today, we'll delve into the world of sleep and dreams. Firstly, let us talk about the basics of sleep cycle and rhythms. Indeed, sleep is not at all a uniform, several hour lasting stage of existence. It is divided into multiple stages, each of which have different characteristics. This is because our bodies are regulated by our internal system called biological clock. Biological clock are mainly controlled by a brain region called suprachiasmatic nucleus. Before we get too excited about human biology, let me just tell you that we are by far not the only ones with biological clock. Genes associated with it have been found in multiple organisms, including mice, fungi, or even bacteria. But back to us humans. If our biological clock are the CEO, in that case, circadian rhythms would be the COO. Because biological clocks produce circadian rhythms, and circadian rhythms produce behavioral and biological changes in our bodies that result in our sleep cycles. I often like to think about sleep cycle as of a roller coaster ride. It rides that lasts around 90 minutes. While there are multiple roller coaster rides per night, usually around five, as we have multiple sleep cycles per night. One sleep cycle is divided into two main stages. That is non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement. Now, let's take a look at rapid eye movement sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is most famously known for being the dream stage of sleep because that's where the majority of your dreams happen. The brain activity during REM stage of sleep is very similar to your brain activity while you're awake, but not quite. Imagine if you're dreaming about being a Spider-Man and jumping from window to window. Hey, look, it's that Spider-Man. Imagine if evolution was not that kind to us as to create a protective mechanism that would prevent us from acting upon that dream. Luckily, majority of us have a state called sleepotonia, which is a temporary paralysis of the majority of our body muscles, thanks to which we, despite jumping out of the windows in our dream, despite riding a car, despite fighting with ninjas, we're still stable in our beds. Overall, as I stated, there are multiple sleep cycles per night. And these sleep cycles differ as the night progresses. Initial sleep cycles usually have higher proportion of deep sleep, while the REM stage of sleep is usually quite short. And this REM stage usually extends as you get closer to the waking period. Therefore, if you want a lot of deep sleep, it's necessary to sleep for quite long. Hi, my name is Shola, and I have currently got COVID-19, which is why I'm isolating in Manga right now, and probably why I look a little scruffy. But I'm here to talk about Individual sleep requirement, your favorite topic to think about. Everybody has this idea of an individual sleep requirement, which is basically how much sleep an individual requires. Science. For you and me, the common Joe, that's probably about like seven to nine hours of sleep. Some people need a little bit more, some people need a little less. So how do you find out your individual sleep requirement? You do that by conducting a series of mini experiments on yourself, like a scientist. And you have to check that, you know, when you go to bed a certain night at a certain time, and let's say you wake yourself up at like 4.30 a.m. instead of usual. Hey Siri, set an alarm for 4.30 a.m. Are you able to walk function on your bed? And if you are being impaired, then increase the amount you need to sleep. And this doesn't mean just doing it over one night. It means doing it over a period of time and seeing how that affects you. But what happens if you continuously violate what your body is asking you to do? You develop something known as a sleep debt. Now, let's get into that a little further. All of us have our own individual biological requirements. Like, for example, when you're extremely, extremely hungry, you have this feeling in your stomach and this little rumbling and it gets satisfied when you put an orange in your mouth. Bad idea. If you're feeling an extremely like dry sense in your throat that makes you sound like a raspy grandma, like you're probably thirsty and you need to consume water. The same way, if you don't have sleep regularly that satisfy your individual sleep requirement, you begin to feel extremely fatigued. You begin to feel irritable. <laughs> You begin to get upset. Why'd I have to take math 51? But most importantly, at certain times in the day, you feel drowsiness. And as we all know, drowsiness is red alert. As it happens to be the case that we are mere mortal humans, our sleep cycles don't come without its problems. For majority of us, the problem might be getting out of stage of sleep. However, this is not a case for people who suffer from a condition called insomnia. People with insomnia might spend quite a lot of time in bed, but it's not a time spent effectively, as insomnia by definition means 
having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. And trust me, it's nothing to be jealous of. It's something that comes head in hand with increased accidents in work, decreased productivity, decreased motivation, and is often a risk factor for different disorders such as depression. However, how do we treat insomnia? There are multiple approaches. Uh, you could use different sleeping pills, they're often prescribed different medications or hormonal treatments, changes in lifestyle such as avoiding alcohol or any substance that can alter your sleep cycle, avoiding caffeine, and trying to lead a healthy life. Wow, Susanna, that's a lot of stuff about sleep I wish never happens to me. But now, Let's talk about some misconceptions about sleep. That was way too much enthusiasm for the amount of sleep I'm actually getting. Number one, it doesn't matter what time of the day you actually end up sleeping. Now, that really isn't true. Although there are individuals who do stay awake for long hours through the night and some individuals due to the constraints of their job have to stay awake throughout the night like night shift workers, studies conducted on these individuals show that they are at higher risks for breast cancer, depression, diabetes and just all round mortality. Number two, loud snoring is relatively harmless. Now, I don't know about you, but my dad snores and he snores a lot and that would worry me except everybody just normally talks about their parents snoring and it's something that all of us are just like used to. But does that mean that could be any health risk associated with it? But to understand that, it's important to deconstruct what actually is happening when you're snoring. Think of it like this. When you have a flute, for example, the way a flute produces sounds is when you create blockages in air passage. That phenomenon is creating this music because when air is going through a blocked passage, it begins to create vibrations that actually ends up producing music. This is exactly what's happening when your body is snoring. When you're snoring, there are certain blockages that are being caused inside the airways that are creating vibrations that is creating noise. Now, in some cases, the snoring might be completely normal and might not have anything to do with a severe sleep disorder. But in some cases, it could be a big risk factor for sleep apnea as an example. When the blockages are so intense that it actually has the ability to choke you, your body will wake up during the night in order to actually breathe. Now, let me stand up for this. We're entering probably my favorite part of this video, which is the world of lucid dreaming. You know how, how VR is really cool because you basically enter a world that's designed specifically for you and you can do whatever you want. What if I told you that there already is a VR in your own head while you're dreaming? Usually when you're dreaming, you're not aware of that. But if you become lucid, if you become aware and conscious of the fact that you're in a dream, you can take control and you can do whatever you want with your dream. So before we get into the more scientific parts of this topic, let us walk around Govco and ask its residents what would they do if they enter the lucid dream, aka what would they do if they could control their dreams? Let's go. Hey Kate. Hey Susanna. What would you do if you could control your dreams? If I could control my dreams, I'd probably pick a different place to travel to every night when I go to sleep. Hey Ray. <laughs> what would you do if you could control your dreams? Um, I'm not gonna lie. I'd probably just try to sleep like <laughs> Matthew over here because I feel like sleeping is a nice reprieve from all the hectic busyness of life. Uh, I would make sure I have really happy and uplifting and motivational and wholesome content in my dreams. That always <laughs> makes me more excited for the day to come when I wake up. I'm more of an optimist for the amazing things this beautiful world has to offer. Thank you. Oscar, what would you do if you could control your dreams? Go to space. Thank you very much to all the Gulf Coast residents for their ideas of what to do if we enter a lucid dream. However, why are we asking if? Is it really that uncommon to lucid dream? Apparently, around 55% of the people had at least one lucid dream for their lifetime. Fingers crossed we're one of them. Now that we had fun, let's look at the more neuroscientific perspective on things. The neuroscience community has not viewed lucid dreaming quite possible for quite a long time. This has changed thanks to a former Stanford researcher called Stephen LeBurge. Stephen LeBurge contributed to the field of lucid dreaming neuroscience immensely. But one of his coolest experiments, in my humble opinion, is when he, did, when he trained participants in his research to signal that they're in a lucid dream thanks to their eye movements, by which he's shown that the phenomena is real. After that, we found a bunch of cool neural correlates of what lucid dreaming actually represents. And it seems like it's some sort of weird limbo stage between the brain activity of a dreaming person versus the brain activity of a person that's awake. While there seem to be certain neural correlates that are fundamental to how your brain is wired up and therefore you have a higher predisposition to be a lucid dreamer in comparison to some other people. However, the 
control is still in your hands, as there seem to be techniques that can increase your chances of becoming a lucid dreamer. Now, Susanna gave you and painted a beautiful picture of how lucid dreaming is similar to virtual reality. And I would agree, except the question becomes, how do you bring someone into that reality? How do you induce lucid dreaming in somebody? There are three big categories of induction techniques that are known to individuals right now. The first are cognitive techniques. The two most widely used cognitive techniques are RT or reality testing and mild, which is mnemonic induction of lucid dreaming. Reality testing is a very, very interesting cognitive technique. What it basically entails is a test that you use to differentiate between reality or a dreamlike or virtual state. Now, to actually understand what this is like, you can take the visualization that the movie Inception gave us. In Inception, characters were given a certain totem and they're supposed to use that totem when they're in the real world and it's supposed to work. And then when they're in the dream state, it's supposed to not really work the way it's intended to. And that's how these individuals are able to find out that they're in a dream and are able to induce lucid dreaming. The same way, individuals are given tests that they can use to differentiate between reality and a dream and then the idea is that they use it a certain number of times in a day over weeks so that when they actually reach a dream state, they're able to remember the fact that they have this test with them that they're able to use, use it and then find out if they're in a dream or not. The second technique that's called mild mnemonic induction of lucid dreams is something that I've actually practiced once before in my life. And the way this works is you're trying to create a perspective memory intention. You're trying to create an intention of re-entering a dream and then being aware of the fact that you're in a dream. So individuals will sleep through the night, wake up after an interval of about say five hours, and then they will tell themselves that they're going to try and fall asleep. And as they fall asleep, they're going to try and think about about a dream that they actually remember as well as a dream sign. Another technique is actually built on the back of the ability to wake up in the middle of the night and then go back to sleep and that is called the wake back to bed technique and it basically causes interruptions in your actual sleep pattern for which a lot of these lucid dreaming patterns or techniques are actually a little bit controversial because the problem that one can readily observe when trying to practice something like this is you're literally interrupting your sleep halfway and that is something that can have a lot of detrimental effects. So none of these techniques are actually perfect. In fact, very few have actually been scientifically verified to be proven as effective techniques to deploy when you're trying to lose the dream. And the one that's seen the most amount of relative success has been mild. Imagine if we lived in a world where we could all lose a dream on command. Sounds fun, right? But what if we could extend the potential of lucid dreaming way beyond your entertainment? Controlling dreams implies we can control our nightmares, and nightmares are an important part of certain psychiatry disorders such as PTSD or anxiety. Actually, a research has already been done where they, where they implemented lucid dreaming therapy on patients with PTSD to alleviate their nightmare symptoms, and over a course of weeks, the nightmares have decreased as a consequence of the therapy. And this is not the end. There's so much unexplored potential in the field of psychiatric disorders and lucid dreaming. And what if we don't have to stick only to psychiatric disorder? What if there are other fields, areas that should be researched in relation to lucid dreaming and its potential. There is so much that's left to be explored and there's so much that's left to be discovered in the field of lucid dreaming. And Susanna and I have a few questions that we'd like to pose to you, the viewer, so that if any day you decide to go into this field or you decide to learn a little bit more about this field, these are some questions that are at the top of your mind. The first question that I would like to pose to you is that we established that lucid dreaming is this state that's in between wakefulness as well as this REM sleep. So a question that I always think about is, does that mean that lucid dreaming Dreaming can take away from the rest that sleep is originally intended to give us and can actually leave us more tired in the morning and that is also coupled with the idea that a lot of the induction techniques cause you to interrupt your sleep. So is lucid dreaming something that we actually want to pursue as a sustainable way to make the most of our time at night? Another question I've been thinking about lately is if lucid dreaming could be in and of itself a new kind of metaverse. We're hearing about this idea of a virtual reality where you're able to control your entire life, you're able to do things you've never been able to imagine. Are we able to simulate some of that inside our own mind? Can we live complete alternative lives through the lens of lucid dreaming and overcome anxiety, overcome PTSD, become better at creativity by visualizing things and creating things through our own manifestations? Are we able to become better at physical performances by practicing them again and again in sleep? These are all questions that could be validated or invalidated through more research. But that, my viewer, we leave out 
Thank you. Thank you for watching viewers and we'll see you next time.